Okay, so the numbers are still going up. Um, what are we on? We've just hit the top of the hour, so we've got a couple of minutes. I hope everybody is enjoying um, what's probably best described as quite a weird year. Um, you guys, students, seem to have borne a bit of a brunt of media backlash, so we feel sorry for you. We understand it's not been a pleasant experience. And normally we would love to come and see you in person at universities. Um, that's part of my job and the crew that is helping me today that I'm going to introduce in a second. We'd also go out to a couple of universities. We obviously can't do that. And this is the best alternative, I suppose, or one of the alternatives. I do hate this padding stuff at the beginning. Uh, obviously, I know my mic is still live, but it's pretty dull just watching a screen. So you're going to have to listen to me instead. So, right, I will start now. It's just at the back of the hour, and there's a bit of housekeeping which will give uh, the stragglers uh, another couple of minutes to join us. But thank you for joining us uh, for the, the uh, virtual careers event that we're going to run today. It's going to take about 90 minutes, maybe 60 to 90 minutes. Uh, we've got some slack time in there as well. Uh, as I've said, a bit of housekeeping. Um, we are really sorry that we can't come out to universities. Me especially, that is part of my role. I love visiting universities, not just the cafeterias, although I am missing university food. Um, but normally we would come and visit you at career fairs um, or do uh, bespoke little lectures and we just can't do that. Housekeeping is obviously mics are on mute. We've done that automatically. Cams are off. Have I put mine on? I'll put mine on actually. Uh, let's see which one it's going to pick up today. It's going to be that one. Um, so there I am. I've got my best jumper on. I'm sitting at home in quite a messy room, unfortunately. Uh, but I'm going to switch my webcam off now as well. So we are all human. And that's something to uh, to mention. You know, give us give us some slack. Uh, we haven't done this format for a careers event before. Uh, we're all quite new to this. Um, we don't know how it's going to work. We'd appreciate some feedback. You can use the chat window. Uh, Katie is going to be relaying that, relaying the questions to the team, and they will then try and answer you. If we've got time and it's working, we'll try and do a Q and A session at the end. So if any of the questions we think would be better, given some actual airtime one of the team will answer them at the end and we'll let you know in the chat window that that's going to happen. Uh, your answers might go back to all attendees as well, not just to you. Uh, so be aware of that when you put questions in. Right, on to the actual stuff. So I've already mentioned myself already. Um, I am the Higher Education Manager for Esri UK. Uh, that means I look after university accounts. I go around speaking to lecturers, helping with bits of research, doing careers engagements, generally evangelizing about the use of GIS and what it can do for you in life beyond university. Previously, I worked for ADENA. If you've ever downloaded Ordnance Survey data, uh, you've probably done it through the ADENA portal. I was part of that team for a good few years. And then before that, I had quite a career in um, GIS consulting. I uh, worked for some lovely consultants in Yorkshire. Um, and prior to that, I worked as a flood data manager for the Environment Agency. I dabbled before that with a bit of snow forecasting, and that links me back to my time as a glaciologist. I did a PhD in glacial remote sensing, uh, mainly because I wanted to go and hang out on a glacier for a while. Uh, when I'm not at my desk driving my computer, I would like to be in the woods riding a bicycle. There's a picture of me. Um, ragging somebody else's bike over a jump in the local woods in the Scottish borders where I live, and that's where I am today. But I'm the least interesting of the presenters because you want to hear about people who were like you uh, just a few years ago, uh, very recently for some of them. And we've got a good team. Uh, we've got Hannah and Haley who are going to tell you about the grad scheme. We've got James and Bong, who are going to talk about alternative routes into Esri UK. They didn't come through the grad scheme. And then we've got Jess, uh, the wise, wise ex-graduate who is now um, graduated from that and another scheme and is working in a role in professional services. So she did the grad scheme, well, she'll tell you, three or four years ago. And that's the running order. Everybody's got about... 10 minutes apart from uh, Hannah and Haley, who are going to do a double act. But before we get into the double act, hopefully, hopefully this is going to work. Now, this should take my 
system sound, but it's to recap on really fundamentally what GIS is. And, and I believe it's that collision point between computer science and geography, and it gets very, very interesting. Uh, and there's a little video I'm going to play. I am going to play it. I'm playing it. Okay, apparently there's no sound, um, which makes this video not as good. So I'm going to skip forward to about here and just narrate over the top of it. So this is a video from Esri's uh, European marketing team. And what they're doing is giving some examples about how GIS use, is used around Europe. Uh, the first one uh, was about uh, crime data and modeling past crime to predict future crime to then uh, have cost benefits for policing, which improves the lives of citizens. Second example, we'll all be familiar with getting parcels that we order on the internet. Well, real-time fleet management optimizes your parcel delivery, saves money for the company delivering it, which should be passed on to the customer. Uh, there's also things in there about zero hour contracts, which um, I think one of the big companies in the UK did recently. Uh, where they said if you follow the prescribed route we'll make you a full-time employee if you go freestyle you know uh, you're on the gig economy the digital twin port of rotterdam uh, the gis team implemented a system to run the port and said it was so easy that a 15 year old could run it the managers challenged them and they got a whole lot of school kids who were 15 to come in and run the port for a, a couple of hours they had people behind them to make sure that they didn't cause any problems but they managed to effectively run the world's largest port using a gis interface uh, and finally, and I'll stop the video after this, just real-time analytics monitoring the health of the planet uh, and having interventions so you don't need a human to look at the data. The amount of data we get um, from sensors is phenomenal and we can't eyeball all of it. And I will stop the video there and go back to the presentation, which is less stressful than having to narrate because I had the sound in my ears, which is a bit distracting, but I'm sorry the sound didn't play. I will stress you're going to get a link to all of the presentations and if you want to watch the video you can in your own time. But Esri is the global leader in GIS software. It's a company which has been around for over 50 years now which puts it in league with Microsoft and Oracle in terms of companies in that tech industry. It's still privately owned by two people Jack and Laura Dangermond and it's profitable and it's doing quite well. We have 80 distributors around the world. This is an interactive map. You can go and uh, explore distributors and see who the distributor in Nigeria is or the one in uh, Papua New Guinea. It's a bit weird. Somebody should, uh, yeah. Actually, Esri, Esri Australia covered Papua New Guinea as well. I think that's why that's uh, aligned like that. Uh, and then you've got New Zealand over here. Nobody likes having New Zealand left over them, off the map. So we're a global company, but Esri UK is a distributor covering the UK and Ireland. And you might think that means that we just sell stuff on. We sell boxes that we get from the States to people in the UK uh, or services. But it's much more than that. And hopefully today is going to give you a flavor of what it is. Uh, there's a rogues gallery of some people who work for Esri UK. Uh, we have offices in Aylesbury. That's our head office and the biggest. The next biggest is probably Edinburgh. It's probably the coolest office as well, because that's the one that I work in. Um, I am biased. And we have an office in Cambridge. Uh, one in Belfast and Esri Ireland's headquarters are in Dublin. Uh, it's a good company to work for, um, lots of interesting people. Uh, the chap with his hood up and the chap looking surprised with the glasses are the current custodians of the company in terms of CEO and CTO uh, and they're very very accessible people. They're not scary at all. I mean they can be scary if they want to be but uh, generally they're, they're, they're really nice and accessible uh, and know pretty much everybody in the company. And finally, to stress, you know, GIS, I, I fundamentally believe that we are awash with data in society at the moment, and it's pretty useless unless you do something to it. You need to turn it into information if you want to get knowledge. And I think GIS really does sit in that interface between data and information. The ex I've got an example here about this is raw data. It's an attribute table. It's much better in a map. You've got two different maps and you can see things, but if you want to work out where to put hospitals if people are dying from cancer, you use this map on the right because it's normalized by population. We know this, we're geographers. And then your intervention is to decide where you would put hospitals. But you have to combine that with uh, information and knowledge about how much 
and you cancer unit costs. And if you had a mythical 350 million pounds a week, how many cancer care units could you put in to England? Uh, I'm using England because it was just English data that I had on the previous screen. Obviously, it would cover uh, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland at the moment. Um, and if the answer was four, the previous map would show you where those four areas would be. And you can present that information to uh, the NHS or the Department of Health and they can make a decision uh, to benefit society. GIS is often overlooked. It's the stuff that happens in the back. Ground. But um, COVID has shown us that data is really quite important for people to make proper decisions and making a decision that is correct and timely can save lives. And this dashboard from John Hopkins University is a great example. It was put together by a small research team. It was actually initially put together by an MSc student uh, and then it grew to be very, very important. At its peak, this little web map application, this little dashboard was receiving 4.5 billion requests a day. That's 4.5 billion requests a day. It's sitting in the Elastic Cloud uh, on um, an Azure box in Microsoft land, and they have kept it up to make sure it doesn't go down. And it takes very complicated information, turns it into usable and useful information. So we've had 1.2 million cases in England um, with that number of deaths, Scotland, so you can see, I'm just exploring the data very quickly and in real time. I put a presentation together three weeks ago, uh, just before the US elections, and the USA was sitting at 7.5 million. And in three weeks, it's added 4 million new cases, uh, which is astonishing. Stuff is not slowing down. But the really nice thing about the dashboard, it doesn't just give you cases, it gives you uh, fatality rates. So 3.82 in England, 3.99 in Scotland, and 3.31 in Wales, it's all roughly comparable, but much higher than places like France and Norway. I'm not an epidemiologist, I've not had to put this together, but I reckon my dad, who is my default computer Luddite, uh, could actually understand this mapping interface and get some usable, useful information out of it. So GIS is at the moment right in the forefront of people's minds because it's being used to analyze quite complicated data to make decisions which fundamentally would save lives. So that's it from me. That's my slightly long-winded introduction.